we are sensing uh, that God is in the business of recruiting men. Uh, we are running a program which we used to call Men Taking Their Rightful Places. That was the name of the program at first. But when we prayed about it, we sensed that uh, maybe the title Men Taking Their Rightful Places was not the correct one. Uh, right now, we are still in the stage of recruiting men. We don't even have men who will take their rightful places. We are recruiting them. We are mobilizing them. So the name of the program under which uh, this meeting is taking place is called Men's Mobilization Retreat. Men's mobilization retreat. Men needs to be mobilized. Uh, this is what we're doing. In this mobilization, there are three things we are trying to achieve in mobilizing men. We are trying to achieve three things. One, we are trying to convert to Christianity men who are not Christians. So that is the outreach dimension of this. Those who do not know Christ, uh, those who do not personally know Christ, who do not have a personal relationship with him, we want to convert them to Christ. <clears throat> God is in need of men who openly acknowledge him as their Lord and Savior. Men who are bold about it, who have received Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are not ashamed about it. They confess it openly in the places where they are working, in the community where they live, and in their churches. They are open about it. The Bible says, he who is ashamed of me among many witnesses, I also will be ashamed of him in front of the angels in heaven. So number one is conversion of men who are not born again to become Christians. Then number two is discipling men. Discipleship is a program which establishes people in the truth. Uh, it makes them to be strong and established believers. So we don't want men who just go to church, <clears throat> but we want men who are strong, very strong in their faith, uh, who are growing in their knowledge of Christ, and in the things of God. And the vehicle that God used in the Bible in producing such men is the vehicle of discipleship. We are trusting that in the future, <clears throat> we'll have a discipleship exclusively for men. Whether it, meet, it meets once a month, we don't know. Where we deal with issues that affect men. And then number three is to uh, train men for service. We convert them, we establish them in their faith, then we train them for effective service. That's the third thing. We want men who are ready to serve God. <clears throat> we note in the Bible that men in the service of God, men were in the forefront. Uh, they were priests, they were prophets, they were judges, they were kings, uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were serving God. And therefore, we want to train men 
uh, to be in the forefront of serving God. Those are the three things we are doing in this program, Men's Mobilization Retreat. There's a phone that is really disturbing us. I wish we could put our phones on silence. When your phone receives messages, those messages um, are disturbing because they are ringing. Can I ask all of you who may have joined with your phone that uh, you put them on silence so that when there are messages that are coming in for you, they don't disturb us. Now, when we prayed about what God wants to discuss with men, God gave us three scriptures. Let me just quickly refer to them uh, just to show you the three scriptures that he showed us. And then we will then begin then with the teaching. The main scripture he showed us is First Corinthians uh, chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. When you read it in the Centurion version of the Bible, in that version, and in many other versions, it uses the word act like man. Verses 13 says, be on, be on, be on the guard, uh, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Then verse 14 says, let all that you do be done in love. So the theme of the conference is act like men. That's the theme of the conference. Act like men. Uh, then another scripture that God gave us is in First Kings uh, chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. But we look only at, at verse 2. This is David speaking to his son when he was just about to die. So he spoke to his son. And he said, the Bible says in verse uh, 2, 1 Kings 2, 2. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 2. It says, I am about to go the way of all the earth. He said, so be strong, show yourself a man. And we instructed the words, show yourself a man. Show yourself a man. You'll note that what is said by Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 16 verse 13, act like man, is what David said to Solomon Show yourself a man. Demonstrate your manhood. Manifest your manhood. This is what he's saying. So these are the two, two main scriptures uh, that God uh, gave to us uh, to deal with. Now, before we go to the scriptures, there are this the the there is something that we want to stress you no know, two things one to to which group of men is god speaking when he says act like a man to whom is he speaking uh, in order for you to understand that so this is point number one in teaching now. In order for you to understand that, you must understand that there are three 
kinds of men. That's the first point. There are three kinds of men. Make those capital letters, if you could, and remove that, uh, uh, that thing, that dot before one. Remove it. Let it be one without the dot before. Whenever I make main points, please do that. Don't have that bulletin. Three kinds of men. That's important. Uh, and then we will know which kind of man is God speaking to. It's very critical. And we get these three kinds of men in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, and also in 1 Peter uh, chapter 6 and verse 11. 1 Peter chapter 6, verse 11. Now, 1 Timothy, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. Let's run through these three kinds of men. And as we're running through them, ask yourself the question, what kind of man am I? One, one, the first kind of man we get is called the natural man. That's the first kind of man, the natural man. Uh, don't put the brackets, don't put, just put one, one without, yes, one, one. The natural man. And we get this natural man in verse 14. Verse 14 says, The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually descent. But when you read this verse in the King James Version, it actually uses the word natural. If you read it in the King James Version, first, first Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says in the King James Version, the man I'm sorry, let me get that in the King James Version to see how the King James Version puts it, uh, put the scripture. It says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually descent. Let's know three things about the natural man uh, which are very critical which will help us to know when we deal with natural men. Uh, we will have an understanding of their limitations. Number one, we are told that they are men without the spirit. That's, that's point one. They are men without the spirit. Spirit with capital S. These men do not have the spirit of God. That uh, description alone tells us a lot. Because when you read in Romans 8 verse 9, it tells us that a man who does not have the Spirit of God does not belong uh, to Christ. It says so. Uh, Romans 8 verse 9, it tells us uh, 
uh, that anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. It says in verse 9, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, <clears throat> but by the Spirit with capital S, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So the natural man then does not belong to Christ, is a man who is not a Christian, because a Christian belongs to Christ. You can't call yourself a Christian and you don't belong to Christ. So the natural man then is a person who does not belong to Christ, who is not born again, who is not a child of God. It is a pity that the majority of men throughout the world fall in this category. They are natural men. They are natural men. According to Romans 8 verse 9, it tells us something else. Point number two, uh, these men are controlled by the flesh, are controlled by the sinful nature. That's two. We're trying to understand them. They are controlled by the sinful nature. Because this, this verse says, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit lives in you. Now, if the Spirit does not live in you, you are not controlled by the Spirit, but rather you are controlled by the sinful nature. If you are to go to Galatians uh, chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, you would see how people who are controlled by the sinful nature behave. We want, we want to describe the natural man. So Galatians uh, chapter uh, 5, verse 19, gives us a catalog of things that a person who is controlled by the sinful nature does. Someone who is not controlled by the, by the Spirit. Uh, verse 19 of chapter 5 says, The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. He's, he's giving us a catalog of the nature of the sinful, the nature or the acts of the sinful nature. Uh, we want to understand the natural man. So he says the sinful nature, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. One, sexual immorality. So men who are natural then will have all kinds of problems with sex, sexual immorality. They'll be married and they'll be having illicit relationship with other women who are married or unmarried. Number one, it's sinful immorality. Number two, uh, we can use bullets there. Number two, it's impurity. Uh, these men are plagued by impurity, impure thoughts. They play around with pornography, and pornography makes them to run after prostitutes, though they are married. Number three, uh, it's debauchery. The word debauchery, uh, let's get a simpler version that will tell us what debauchery is. It says uh, immorality, impurity, impure thoughts, is eagerness for lustful pleasure. That's the explanation of debauchery. Uh, it is eagerness for lustful pleasure. So men who do not belong to Christ, they have eagerness for lustful uh, acts. 
eagerness to uh, to engage in lust of pleasure. Eagerness to engage in lustful pleasure. That's what the Bible says. Now, that's number three. And number four, idolatry. Uh, they will uh, worship the dead. Men who are not born again are very strong on ancestral worship. They feel so strong about it that they they will think that there's something wrong with you. They argue for a central worship. Um, they say they are recognizing the dead. Um, they will argue for it. They will be emotional in arguing for it. And uh, worshiping anyone who is dead is idolatry. Thou shalt have no uh, God, gods besides, besides me. Idols, gods in heaven, on earth, and beneath the earth. The ancestors were buried beneath the earth, but men who uh, do not know Christ, they worship idols. Uh, the next one, number five, is participation in, dem in demonic activities. Participation in demonic activities is like consulting witch doctors, uh, going to people who have got powers of darkness. Uh, these people who have got powers of darkness get that power from demons and therefore you participate in demonic activities. <clears throat> Number six, hostility. They are hostile. All the wars <clears throat> that are taking place around the world have, have not been started by women. All the wars that are taking place are wars that have been started by men. Men like to shed blood. And then number seven, quarreling. Men are very argumentative. You will find men quarreling about nothing. They can quarrel about which car is best, Mercedes Benz and BMW. And someone else will say, no, both of them are not good. Uh, Jaguar is the best. So they like to quarrel. They will argue about football, argue about, box, about boxing. We had a story in America of a man who killed his son because they were debating about American basketball. And they argued, they took out a gun and they killed his son. Quarreling. Then the next thing, men who are not, uh, who are natural, they are characterized by jealousy. Jealousy. There's a phenomenon in South Africa I don't know in other countries. But in South Africa, it is common for men to kill their girlfriends when their girlfriends tell them that the relationship is finished. It's caused by jealousy. So that's another characteristic of men who are natural. And then the next one, which is very prominent with men, outburst of anger, outburst of anger. Men are very angry. Uh, men are angry because of their anger, they don't punish their children. They, they assault their children. And in the Bible we are taught not to assault children, uh, but to, uh, to, to raise them in love. They are angry against uh, their children. There was a case in South Africa of a man who killed a toddler, who beat a, a toddler to death. And women are also assaulted. The issue of uh, domestic violence, 
uh, men have got what is called, uh, what is it called? Uh, rage, um, traffic rage. I forget the exact word that is used. Anger uh, between motorists. Some will take a, car, a gun and kill. Uh, is because men are generally angry. And then se selfish ambition. Selfish ambition is another one. Even when it comes to sex, men are controlled by selfish ambition. They will want to have sex with their wives, whether they are sick, whether they feel like having sex or not feeling like having sex. So that's why there's a, a phenomenon which you cannot understand, but it is true. Married men raping their wives. Because rape is when you sleep with someone without her consent. That's the definition of rape, to sleep with someone without consent. Even when you're married, if you sleep with your wife without her consent, you're committing rape. And, and then the next thing is divisions. And that's the next thing that characterizes natural men, divisions. Divisions are along, along tribal lines, division along national, national lines, division against racial lines. Women don't ma have no problem marrying someone from another, another race. Even during the time of uh, apartheid, women had no problem, white women had no problem getting married to black men. But it was white men who could not fathom the idea of a white woman getting married to a black woman. Divisions. Then the feelings that everyone is wrong except those in their own little group. Men are always right. The complaint I always get from women that I counsel they always complain about the fact that my husband thinks that she, he's the only one who's right. As a result, he does not take an opinion from me as his wife. When we argue, I've never heard my husband saying, I'm sorry I was wrong. I can see your point. Men have got this arrogance that they are always right and women are always wrong. Unfortunately, this happens even with men who are born again. Men who have received Christ as their Lord and Savior. They've got the arrogance to think that they are the only ones who are right. And a wife and grown-up children uh, are wrong. This is the characteristic of natural men. So... They are controlled by the sinful nature. Then another thing we see about natural men, we are told that they regard the things of God as foolishness. That's three. They regard the things of God as foolishness. That three with, you know, see the three ahead of you, how you've written it. Um so they um they regard the things of God as foolishness. They regard when you tell them that Christ died on the cross for their sins to be to be forgiven, to them that is foolishness. When you tell them that Christ can come and live in their hearts, to them that is foolishness. They are trying to understand the things of God with their natural mind. And their natural mind cannot fathom the things of God. And therefore, because they cannot fathom the things of God, then they regard them as foolishness. And then number four, a natural man, if you read it in the King James Version, 
He says they are incapable. They are incapable of understanding spiritual things. <clears throat> they cannot understand them. And then the Bible gives us the reason. He says because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the one that explains the things of God. So a natural man does not understand the things of God because they are not intellectually discerned, but they are spiritually discerned. So well, that's the first kind of men we have in the world. Unfortunately, 80% of men, maybe it could even be 90% of men, fall in this category. Because men, most men, are not Christians. Uh, where people who are Christians between men and women are women. Are women. All over the world, this ph phenomenon is worldwide. <clears throat> it is women who respond to the gospel, and women are the ones who fill up our churches. Some men don't mind taking their children, the, the, I mean their wives and children to church. And then they go, go home and go and read newspaper and watch uh, sports. Uh, so most men are natural men. Then the second category of men is known as spiritual men. That is the second category. And it is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. Spiritual men. That is the second category that we find on earth. Spiritual men. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 and verse 15 tells us about the spiritual man. And it also describes the characteristic characteristics of a spiritual man. The spiritual man makes judgment about all things. But he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. If you read that in the Phillips translation, <clears throat> it says in the Philip New Testament, the spiritual man, on the other hand, has an insight into the meaning of everything. So what is the first characteristic? An insight into the things of God. That's point one. Uh, the spiritual man has an insight <clears throat> into the things of God. <clears throat> but number two, it says it has an insight to the, into the meaning of everything. That's number two. An insight into the meaning of everything. The reason is that he has the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives him, him insight into business, insight into academia, insight into politics, in, insight into uh, labor issues. He has an insight <clears throat> into everything. There was the Holy Spirit in him. Um, gives him an insight into these things. Then it says, though his insights may baffle the men of the world. So number three, his insights baffle the men of the world. His insights baffle the natural man. Um, the natural man cannot understand <clears throat> how the spiritual man reasons or how he thinks. He has no capacity to understand. Um, he will, uh, the, the, the natural man will go to 
the man of God and say to him, I didn't understand what you meant. I now understand. I really, really understand what you are saying. Uh, it's because the Spirit of God gives him insight <clears throat> into many things. He may be known as a wise man. Say, so such and such a man is a wise man. Uh, his wisdom comes from God. God makes him a wise man. God gives him um, perceptive, perceptive insights into things because he walks with God. And then the third category of man, the third category of man is known as the man of God. The man of God. That's the third category of man. The man of God. Let's see a scripture that talks about that first. Uh, Timothy uh, chapter 6 and verse 11 uh, gives us this category of the man of God. It is first Timothy uh, chapter 6 and verse 11. We'll see the category of this man of God. Uh, it, it, it is more advanced even that, than, than just a, a man who's just born again, but who does not, who has not grown to be a man of God. 6.11 says, <clears throat> But you, men of God, flee from this. Let's stop there. You men of God flee from this. What is the man of God fleeing, fleeing from? It, he flees from what is mentioned in verses 6 to 10. Let's go to verse 6 to 10 and see what the man of God flees from. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with, with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap. Let's read that in verse 9 in King James. Because King James says something that gives us, gives us an insight. It says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. There's another version that says those who want to get rich quickly. There's a version that says that. If Nom Zandile can find that verse, <clears throat> those who want to get rich quickly. It says, so it says, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men, M-E-N, that plunge men into ruin and destruction. Verse 11, for the love of money is a root of all kind of evils. Some people eager for money have wandered from faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. <clears throat> what is discussed in verses 6 to 10 is summarized by one word that Christ uses in uh, Matthew 6.24, the word mammon. That's the one word that summarizes this, mammon. Mammon is worship of money and material things. That's mammon. It's when you worship money and when you worship material things. Now, men, women also like money and material things, but men even more so. Men don't mind to go to a witch doctor who will say, in order for you to have money, 
you must kill your son and uh, make a sacrifice. And then you'll be rich. A man will kill his son in order to be rich. He will kill his son in order to be rich. They will go to all kinds of things in order to amass riches. So that, that first uh, Timothy 6, 11, he says, run from these things. Run away from materialism that so controls you that you can do uh, terrible things. Some will go to Nigeria to certain prophets in order to ministers, in order to be prayed for by the, that prophet, in order that their churches might be, might be full of people will be pay, paying tithes and offerings. They do, men are daring when it comes to money and material things. Now the Bible says, but, but you men of God, flee from these things. And then let's now mention then what the man of God pursues. Um, IT, you'll be helping me now to list the things that the man of God pursues. Uh, they are mentioned the eight things. Now, when you're a man of God, one, you pursue righteousness. <clears throat> you pursue righteousness. Number two, you pursue godliness. You pursue it. You want to be a righteous man. You want to be a godly man. You, are. you don't just want to be a Christian, but you want to be a, 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 a godly Christian. They pursue faith. The man of God has faith in God. So he takes everything to God, every difficulties, every challenge, he takes it to God. If there's challenge in his marriage, he goes to God. If the children are misbehaving, he seeks for wisdom from God. If the business is not going well, he does not go to a witch doctor to make the business to go well. He pursues faith. Abraham is one such man. He is known as a man of faith. And the Bible says, all the men who believe in God, they belong, they belong to God. He pursues faith. Number four, he pursues love. He loves his wife. He loves his children. He loves the brethren. Uh, he pursues love. He's a loving man. And when we talk to the children, they will never complain. Uh, that is molesting them, he is uh, he is he's abusing them physically or emotionally. He's a loving man, and he pursues that. And number five, he pursues endurance. Life is full of challenges. Life is not easy. When we're children. We thought that life was getting a, a big piece of, if you're a man and you are an adult, you get a, a big piece of meat. That's what we thought adulthood meant. We didn't realize that if you're a man, before you can get a big piece of meat, you must have worked to buy that meat. So there are many challenges in life. When the business is not going well, the wife will say, let's close it, let's close this business. But the man says, no, let's give it a chance. Let's give it a chance. It may pick up. Uh, they are enduring. Enduring. And then many people are doing well in life. Will, they will tell you the struggles they went through and how they enjoyed. And now the business is doing well. Then the next uh, characteristic of a, a man of God is gentleness. I think is very scarce 
in natural men, they're not gentle. The opposite of gentleness is roughness. That's the opposite. Rudeness. But man of God uh, is known by gentleness. He's a gentle person. Gentle. Christ is gentle. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, 29, learn from me, for I am humble and gentle. Christ is known for his gentility. And if you're a man of God, you're going to be a gentleman. You will not be harsh when dealing with your children and very harsh in dealing with your wife. And then the last characteristic of a man of God he fights the good fight of faith. That's verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. That's number seven. He's fighting for the things of God. He's fighting for the kingdom of God to be expanded. He is fighting to bring heaven to the earth. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He fights the good fight of the faith. Here, the faith refers to beliefs, Christian beliefs. It does not mean believing. When it speaks of the faith, fight the good fight of the faith, put the, the capital, I mean the let at the before faith. Fight the good fight, fight of the faith. Of the faith. Fight the good fight of the faith. The faith refers to all the beliefs put together as Christians. So this man knows what we believe. We believe in the Trinity. And when the someone is coming to fight the Trinity, he fights that fight. We believe that Christ is the Son of God. He died and was resurrected. When someone fights the resurrection of Christ, he fights that. So he fights anyone who fights our belief system. All that we believe as Christians is called, is called the tenets of the faith. T-E-N-E-T-S. The tenets of the faith. So he finds that. Number eight, take hold of the eternal life to which we are called. When we made, when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So he, he holds on to eternal life. He holds on to eternal life. That's the man of God. Now you can see there's a difference between these three kinds of men. There's the natural man who is not born again, who does not, who does not understand the things of God. To him, the things of God are foolishness. He has no capacity to understand them because he does not have the spirit that helps him to understand them. That's a natural man. Then secondly, there is the spiritual man. This is the man who's born again and the Spirit of God lives in him, and therefore he belongs to Christ. He's a child of God. Um, he's a child of God. And there are things that char characterize him. Number one, he has insights into spiritual matters. And number two, he has insights to everything else. He's an insightful man. And then there is the man of God, then the man of God is totally different from just a man who's born again. So it is the wish of God that all men would graduate from being Christian men to becoming men of God. God wishes they would graduate and become men of God. So now this injunction or this command, act like a man. To whom is it directed? It is directed to 
man number two and man number three. Act like a man. For the natural man to act like a man is to build muscles. To act like a man is to beat up others. Act like a man is to be a tyrant in your home. That's the understanding of a natural man, what it means to be, to act like a man. To act like a man is to have extramarital relationships. To act like a man is to have children all over the world. I heard of a man who's got 32 children. And some boast about it. They think that when you do these things, you are acting like a man. This is the understanding of a natural man. What it means to act like a man is to lift up her irons, her iron and become hefty, uh, build muscles, and uh, wear tight uh, shirt that will show out your, your muscles. You are acting like a man. If you act like a man, you don't take any nonsense from anyone. If anyone is doing something wrong, you must beat him up. You may even kill him. You are acting like a man. Uh, when you act like a man, you are a ladies' man. You boast that made women are falling over each, each other, uh, pursuing you. So the more women you have, is the more manly, manly you seem. It's not enough for you to have these women, you must impreg impregnate mo most of them and have a lot of children. And you boast about having many, many children. Then when you do that, you are acting like a man. When you act like a man, you must uh, get a lot of money. It doesn't matter how you get it. Whether you get it through killing people, you get it through uh, using uh, 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 using magic wands to use uh, certain African uh, African muti, uh, African uh, medicine that will make you rich. If you must kill your son, your firstborn, to be rich, you don't mind killing your, son, your firstborn because you are a star, you'll get other children. But to act like a man as a child of God, as number two, the spiritual man, is to do the things that the Spirit of God tells you to do and to refrain from everything that the Spirit of God tells you not to do. That's, that's what it means to act like a man. But now for the man of God, to act like a man it means you pursue righteousness. You want to live a righteous life. You want to live a godly life. You are a man of faith. You are a man of love. You are a man of endurance. You are fighting the battles of God. That's the man of God. Now, God is speaking then to men of God, to the men of God, and is speaking also to the man of the spirit, the man who is born again. Do you fall in any of those two categories? Or are you a natural man? A man without Christ? A man without the spirit of Christ? A man who has no relationship with God? A man who does not go to church? A man who never gives money to church for the advancement of the kingdom of God? We are a man who's not interested in the things of God. God is not speaking to you. You are not acting like a man. You must be born again first before you can act like a man. That's the first point we want to deal with. Then the second point, which is very important, is point number two. We must put childish things away. You can't act like a man if you don't put childish 
things away. That's point number two. You must get rid of childish uh, things. And then you will begin to act like a man. And we find this in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 11. Paul is giving his own testimony. He says, I once as a man <clears throat> acted like a child. And we'll see how a child acts from this verse. We'll go to back to verse 6 and see how a child works, work, how a, ch a child acts. And you'll know that men, many men act like children. You may be surprised when I say so, but they act like children. And until you want to do away with childish things, you will never act like a man. Let's read uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child. Sometimes if you're in a taxi and you hear men joking with one another about what they did during the weekend, how that, uh, I'm talking about natural men, how that they were in a party and they filled up the table with the beers and they talk about that. That's childish talk. Or they talk about women. They're talking about women. You not you notice this is childish talk. I was working at the university and we were invited by the vice chan chancellor to his house. And there were two gentlemen who were working in the department of law. One of them, I can't mention his name, is a big man in South Africa now, but I was teaching with him. And he was with another one who's also a big man now in South Africa, big man. But we're working, to get, working together at the university. <clears throat> we're invited by, by the chancellor to his home. We are waiting in the living room before the vice chancellor comes. And then these guys are talking. And I was astounded, they were talking about cars. I live in Amtata, and the next town is East London. And when you go to East London, between Amtata and a town called Aidujwa, they are windy roads. They are very windy. Now these guys are talking. One is talking about Mercedes Benz, a certain class of Mercedes Benz. He says, that, that car is good. When you go over the Benz, he explains how it opens the suspension. And then the car can navigate the, uh, the curves very easily. Another one says, no, you don't know a certain class, a certain series of BMW. He says, BMW uh, navigates those curves uh, quickly. I mean, uh, uh, ably. I did not have a Mercedes Benz. I did not have a BMW. So it meant I could not contribute in that, in that discussion. I, I was just watching as they were exchanging, they were talking. That is childish talk. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. We'll see how a child thinks. I reasoned like a child. I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. If you are going to become a man of God, make a decision that you will not talk like a child, you will not think like a child, you will not reason like a child. You will not reason like a child. You will put away childish things. 
because we want to act like a man. Now let's go now to verses, the verses that go before this one. Uh, when, when, when Paul says, when I became a man, you are, you are noticing that in that verse 11, he's talking about manliness. Everything he says in 1 Corinthians 13, he's talking about how a man should behave. He's talking about how a man should behave. Um, and everything that a man does must be characterized by love. That's manliness to love. Let's go back now, backwards, and see the things that a man should avoid if he acts like a man. First Corinthians 13, let's go to verse um six no to verse four i'm sorry to verse four i'm going to live out the first part love is patient and love is kind we're going to live that out we want to talk about things that love does not do these are the things you must put behind you. One, if you write down, love does not envy. If you want to act like a man, you put envy behind you. The Bible says you must not envy your neighbor's wife. You must not envy your neighbor's s and everything that your neighbor owns. So if you want to act like a man, number one then, what things to put away. Things to put away. It will be uh, 2.1. What must you put away if you, this is point two one. Things that you must put away if you want to act like a man. Number one, you must not envy. You must not envy. That's the thing you must avoid. Sometimes men fight and kill each other because of envy. Number two, it does not boast. Boasting is a childish thing. If you buy a child new clothes, he's going to boast for his uh, children. Have, have you ever seen a man boasting about his clothes? He wears a nice suit, uh, very colorful, nice shirt, and you boast about that. That's childish. You don't wear clothes as a man who is mature. You don't wear clothes to attract women. You don't wear clothes for showiness. You wear clothes for being presentable. That's the purpose of wearing clothes. To be presentable is not to boast. So you put away boasting. You boast about cars, you boast about class. Another man told me, I'm telling a true story. He was telling me with another friend of mine. He says to us, I've got a lot of money. We didn't ask him about money. First of all, he showed us that he has got a Mercedes Benz. He was hanging uh, keys to, to show off. And then he says, I've got a lot of money. Oh, millions, millions are just coming in. I built a BMW, I mean, a, a, a B, B and b house. And he says, I built that house now, it's full of gas. I extended it, I made another floor, I also fall. He was just talking about the thing that he has. That's childish. That's childish. Once you hear a man who boasts, you know he's a child. Number three, love is not proud. Some men are very proud. Even proud against their own wives. 
Some men will say, if I had not married you, where would you be? You are what I am because I married you. I built you a house. You are driving a nice car. Oh, boast pride, pride. That's childishness. Love is not pride. It's not proud. Number four, it does not delight in evil. A mature man does not delight in evil. For you to be boasting of the girlfriends that you have while you are married, you are delighting in evil. You are actually delighting in evil. So a mature man will not do something that is evil and delight in it. And delight in it. Uh, those are... Uh, I, I, I skipped verse 5. Love is not a root. Verse 5. Love is not a root. Maybe put it after pride. Put that on after pride. Love is not root. Men can be very root, very, very root. And they know how to cut you into pieces. They can make you feel small. What is perturbing about men? They are even rude to their wives in the, the way they deal with their wives. They are rude. They speak to their wives as if they speak to children. They scold them in public, in public. Their wives are afraid because they are not afraid to reprimand them in public. That's rudeness. It is rude for you to raise your voice in public, to raise your voice in public, and you are talking to your wife. If there's something wrong that she does, wait until you are in a private place. Don't, don't embarrass her in public. Some wives are afraid when you open your mouth, they say, please don't embarrass me in public. They are afraid what you're going to say. That's, that's childishness. That's childishness. Number six, uh, love is not self-seeking. So men are, are self-seeking. They want something that comes only to them. That's why even in their relationship, sexually with their husbands, with their wives, they're self-seeking. A man does not mind to sleep with his wife and once he's satisfied, he does not care whether the wife is satisfied or not. That's self-seeking, uh, self-seeking. Number seven, uh, Child, childishness, he says, love is not easily angered. And people, men like to be easily angered. They will always apologize after they've said something they should not have said, after they've done something they should not, should not have done. They're very easy, easily angered. Very easily angered. Uh, and children, you know that children, they scratch each, each other. Children will fight and throw things. They are angered because someone has taken their toy, toy car. It's my car, you can't play with it. They will beat up the other child. That's childishness. So these are the characteristics of childishness, envy, boastfulness, Pride, rudeness, delighting in something that is evil, self-centeredness, and rage of anger. So Paul says now, I did away with those things. And before Paul was born again, he, he, he fought. He arrested people. He got letters. He took them to jail. He, he even says that I, I dragged men and women, men and women. 
I put I put them into jails. When Stephen was killed, Paul was keeping the clothes of the man who killed Stephen. Uh, he was proud of being a Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, born uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin. He says it in Philippians 3 is boasting about his about these things. He says, I did away with those things. When I became a man, I stopped talking like a man. I mean, talking like a child, thinking like a child, and reasoning like a child. Now, he, he noticed that how he treated Gentiles and how he treated people who do not belong to his religion, Judaism, uh, he was acting like a child. Then he says, when I became a man, I quit away childish thing. Listen now, how does a, a man act instead of a child? How does a man act? Let's go back again to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 and see how man acts. In verse 4, love is patient. When you're a real man, you are patient. We are patient. Do you know men are so impatient even with their wives? When they're discussing a matter, and the wife cannot reason and raise things, very, very patient. Love is patient. A mature man is patient. Act like a man. Act like a man, be patient. Number two, love is kind. Act like a man and be kind. Be kind to your wife. Be kind to your children. Be kind to your sisters or your brother's children. Be kind to your parents. Kind to your parents. Love is kind. Uh, number Verse 6, love rejoices with the truth. Love rejoices with the truth. When you are a child, even if something is truthful, you don't rejoice in it. But if you are a mature man, even when the truth is against you, it does not matter. When you're arguing and you realize that the truth is against you, then you are, you are, you take it to say, yes, you're right. You're right, you're right. Point number one, love is patient. I don't know why you've moved love is patient. And then number four, um, Number four uh, is found in verse seven. Love protects. I, I wish you could just be writing the things that, that I'm saying. It. Love protects. So when you're a real man, you'll protect your wife. You will protect your wife even against your relatives. When your relatives are, are saying your wife is lazy, your wife is not tidy, you will protect your wife because you're mature. She's your wife. Even when people are say, even when the things they say about your wife are true, you want to protect your wife. You want to protect your life because love protects. And then when you correct your wife, you're going to correct your wife in private, not in front of other people. When they when they say bad things about your wife, 
You don't agree. You say, you're right, I've seen these things. This is the kind of a person I'm living with. No, no. No, 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 no. You protect your children. You protect your children. If someone comes and says a lot of bad things about your children, you protect them. If the things they are saying are true, you deal with them, but you protect them. Uh, number five, love. Uh, trust. If you are mature, you'll be trusting. Trust your wife. Trust your partners. Trust other people. You're mature. Because in the first place, you would never have entered into partnership with someone you don't know. Now, once you enter into partnership with someone you know, you are duty bound to trust that person. You must trust that person. Because you can't, can two, can two work together unless they are agreed. You can't work in business to someone you don't trust. While you are working, trust your colleagues until they prove themselves otherwise. Don't move from the uh, from the point of view of not trusting. Move from the point of view of trusting people until they prove they cannot be trusted. Number seven, is it number six or seven? Love hopes. When you're a man, you hope, even when things are bad. Things are real bad. Because if you are a, a true, mature man, you have faith. So you're going to be praying to God about situations, and God will be telling you some things, and then you've got hope. It is Paul that talks about hope in Romans chapter 8. He says that you hope for what you don't see. He says, what is the point in hoping what you already see? So faith and hope go together. Then if you're mature, uh, this is how you will act. You'll be a hopeful person. Sometimes things are not going well in your house and your wife is frustrated. You don't join her. And when she says, oh, things are falling apart. Oh, this car is going to be taken. Oh, my children will be uh, expelled from school. They are women. They can think like that. But if you are a man, say, no, don't worry. Things will be all right. Talk to God. Let's pray. Let's not complain about things. Let's pray, my wife. There's a God in heaven who answers prayer. When the business is not doing well, it is, it is floundering, and uh, you are not breaking even. There are rents to be paid, there are employees to be paid, and things are not going well. You trust, you hope, you hope. That's, that shows maturity. And finally, love perseveres. So he says he acted in this way, he became patient, he became kind, uh, he stuck to the truth about Christ, even though he used to reject the message of salvation. Paul embraced it. He discovered it was the truth. He protected believers, trusted God, he trusted other people. He was hopeful. He was persevering. Uh, it was persevering. And then in verse 8, he says, love never fails. That's number eight. Love never fails. When you act in this way, you will not fail. When you are patient with God, patient with your spouse, patient with other people, you will not fail. When you are kind to your wife, because charity must be begin at home. If you are kind to outsiders, but you are not kind to your wife, you are a hypocrite. You are kind at home, uh, you rejoice with the truth. Even if your wife comes up with something that you, you did not know, you, you embrace it if it is the truth. You protect, you trust, you hope, 
you persevere, you will never fail when you act in these ways. Act like a man. How does a man act? He's patient. Act like a man. How does a man act? He's kind. Act like a man. How does a man act? How does a man act? A man always embraces truth, even from the enemy. If it is true, it is true. Even from a child, your own child, you embrace the truth. Act like a man. How does a man act? A man is very protective of his wife, of his children, of his elderly parents who no longer have means of support, you support them. You must talk it over with your wife and support your parents. Love, uh, how does a man act? Act like a man. A man is trusting. You don't accuse your wife of everything if she talks to another man already. He's in love with that man. When he speaks on the phone, you want to know, to whom are you speaking? Uh, why do you speak to this man from your work? Why don't you trust your wife? Because they're no longer with her. And sometimes your wife is very faithful, is a very faithful wife. But out of jealousy, you don't trust your wife. How can you build a relationship where there is no trust? Act like a man. You must be hopeful even when things are bad. Let me show you a scripture about that one. Uh, hopeful, love, hopes. Let's go to Romans. I want to show you something in Romans chapter 4 to see this issue of hope. Romans uh, chapter 4 speaks about our brother uh, Abraham says in verse 18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Did you see that? For verse 18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believes. And so he became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said, so shall your offspring be. Verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. That's verse 19. He faced the case, he was 100 years old. He says his body was as good as, as dead. Since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. This is, this is him. And then his wife died when he was, I think, 130 years. He married another woman. He got other children, about five, five children. Against all hope, he hoped. If you are a man against all hope, you'll continue to hope. Can you imagine you're living in a situation uh, which is really testing? It's a testing situation. You don't hope, and your wife also does not hope, and you cry on each, each other's shoulders, console, consoling yourselves in your hopelessness. Can you imagine? There must be a man when the wife uh, throws away all hope. There must be a man who staunchly hopes, who says, no, 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 I've talked to God. God is going to do it. Act like a man. Be hopeful even in difficult situations. Maybe I'm talking to you right now. You are facing a very challenging situation. Maybe. You have been praying for a child, and your wife has lost hope. But as a man of God, if you pray and pray, God can still give you a child. Don't lose hope. Maybe your business is not going well, 
uh, you are, you have you have worked very hard. You you have worked your bottom off, but things are not going well. Don't be hopeless. Don't be hopeless. Continue to be hopeful. Continue to call, talk to God, and see what God will do. Love perseveres. Hope and perseverance go together. You must persevere. The business is going to come right. The relationships between you and your brother will be right. Persevere, persevere, don't give up. Don't give up easily as a man. A man does not give up easily. And when you do those things, you will definitely, you, you'll see the results of acting like a man, acting like a man. Let's see, lastly now, the scripture that uh, the Lord used as a text. Point three. Point three. Um, first Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13. This is point number three. Not two or three, but point number three. Uh, the theme, the the theme text for the lack of a better uh, subject. Let's look at the theme text. Let's look at the theme text. The theme text is First Corinthians, chapter sixteen, verses thirteen and fourteen. Some of you there are issues with your wife. Just continue to trust God, please. I continue to trust God. I'm reading this verse in the Centurion version, or even the Amplified. Maybe let's read it in the Amplified um, and see what the Amplified says. First Corinthians. Just write there the theme text, exploring the theme text, please. Write that down. We're exploring the theme, the theme text. First uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 16 and verses 13 and 14. We want to see five things there. We want to see five things concerning that text. That is the theme text. That will be the last thing we're dealing with tonight. And then we'll be raising prayer points. And IT will help us to go back to explore what I've talked about and then raise prayer points. First Corinthians uh, chapter 16 and verses 13 and 14. It reads in the Amplified, be alert and on your guard. Stand firm in your faith, in your convictions respecting man's relationship to God and divine things. Keep the trust and holy fever born of faith and a part of it. Act like man and be courageous. Grow in your strength. What are the five things that are mentioned in the scripture? Number one is be watchful. That's the first thing. To act like a man is to be watchful. You must bear in mind that you are the priest of your home. And you are the watchman of your home. It is your responsibility to watch things that will harm your wife. To watch things that will harm your children. If God has blessed you with grandchildren, to watch things that will harm your grandchildren. 
if you are running a business to watch things that will harm your business. Maybe things are not going well in your business because you are not watchful enough. You are not watchful enough. You started to see that things are going wrong when things were really, really wrong. When things could not be corrected. You must be watchful. You must be diligent. You must be watchful. A man is watchful. We are going to read tomorrow that the Bible says a man must manage his house, his household well. It requires watchfulness. When your child is beginning to be wayward and you didn't realize that the things your child was doing were going to lead to catastrophe, but you, you only became aware later. You are not aware that your child seems to be behaving in a very uh, peculiar manner. Maybe she's is in drugs. Maybe your daughter is becoming promiscuous. You're not watching, you're not seeing this. So you can't correct, you can't advise. So as a man, you must be watchful. A man must be able to look on all directions and see where danger will be coming from. Watchfulness is important. Christ talking about um talking about scribes and Pharisees who were not watchful, he used an example. He says that when the blind leads the blind, they both fall into a pit and they are destroyed. It means the leader is not watchful and the followers relying on the leader, they are also not watchful and they both fall into the pit. He says this is in Matthew chapter 5. So be watchful, be watchful. It's important for you to be watchful. That's the first injunction. That's the first command God gives you. As a man, act, as a, act like a man. How will you act like a man? Watchfulness. Watchfulness. It's so critical. May God give you even more insights on that matter of watchfulness. Number two, stand fast in the faith. We put the article V. That's number two. Stand fast in the faith. Which means the man must know the faith. The man must know the faith. And when it speaks of the faith, it speaks of what you call Christian tenets. That's the word that is used. Christian tenets. Uh, the faith of our father, the faith of our fathers, that's important. Now, let me mention tenets is T-E-N-E-T-S, one N. -E -T -S -1 -N. Uh, let's mention then 10 doctrines that you as a man must know. It's, it's not right for you not to know doctrines, the faith. What are the things that you must know as doctrine? If you are to Google the Nicene Creed, Nicene Creed, N-I-C-E-N, I believe in this, I believe in this, that creed was formed by uh, church fathers. And they are, they, are, they are a standard of things that men must know. Number one, you must know the Bible. You must know the Bible. 
you must be well acquainted with the Bible. That's number one. Number two, you must know God the Father. The Bible says, this is eternal life that they know me. Uh, let's go to that. Know the Father, John 17, uh, and see what John 17 says. John 17, 17, it says, uh, is it 15? Let's go to 15. Uh, I want the scripture that says, uh, this is eternal life. I think it's 17. Uh, I think. Uh, knowing the Father. 17, verse uh, 17, sanctify them with the truth, thy word is truth. Thou hast sent me uh, into the world, even so I sent them into the world. Um, I want the verse that says, this is eternal eternal life to know you. Why am I not seeing that verse? Uh, I want to stress the point that if you are a man, you must know God the Father. If you are a man, you must know God the Father. Uh, you must be acquainted with the Father. You must be acquainted with the Father as a man. And you must know, uh, number three, you must know Christ. You must be acquainted with Christ. It's important to know Christ. Very important to know Christ, to be uh, particularly acquainted with Christ. The verse I was looking for is... 17 verse 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent into the world. That is eternal life. So a part of then doctrine is to know the Bible, to know everything that the Bible teaches about the Father, is known as the doctrine of God the Father. Then you must know the doctrine about the Son called Christology. Christology, knowing the Son. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, second uh, Peter 3.18. Then number four, you must know the Holy Spirit. You must know, you must know the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to have the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to be baptized with the Spirit? What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? What does it mean to be guided by the Spirit? You must know that. Number five, you must know the doctrine about sin. You must know what the Bible says about sin. Sin unto death, sin that is not unto death, and then all kinds of sins, and the results of sin, uh, where sins come from, you must know that. You must know the doctrine of salvation. That's important. That's number six, the doctrine of salvation. You must know the doctrine of the church, ecclesiology. What does the Bible teach about the church? Who is the church? How does the church function? Who are the leaders of the church? How are, how are leaders elected? You must know that. You must know that. And then the next thing that you must know, you must know the doctrine of the Christian faith. You must know the Christian faith. What is the Christian faith? 
in particular. Then number nine, you must know the doctrine of angels. The doctrine of angels. You must know that there is what we know as elect angels. These are the angels that did not fall. They are elect angels. And then there are angels that fell into sin. They are called demons. You must know. You must know about good angels. Elect angels. And you must know also about bad angels. Angels that fell with Satan. And lastly, you must know the doctrine of end times. It's called eschatology, the doctrine of end times. You must know. So we're told then in that verse 13, how a man of God must act. How does a man of God act? That first, uh, Corinthians 6, 13, one, you are watchful. Number two, you are standing fast in the faith. Because this is what you are teaching to your children. Uh, I'm sorry, the font is very small. You are standing firm. You are standing firm in the faith. Then number three, in that verse 13, uh, be watchful, stand fast in the faith, act, act like men. That's, that's number three. Act like men. That's what it says. Act like men. In how you talk, talk like a man. In what you think, think like a man. In how you reason, reason like a man. In the things you do, act like a like act like man. Don't act like a child. Don't even act like a woman. We are made men and women, the Bible says in Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 17. He made them man and female. Don't act like a woman because you're not a woman. Don't think like a woman because you're not a woman. Don't reason like a woman because you're not a woman. And a woman also must not act like man and think like man and reason. Well, she's not a man, she's a woman. That's where complementarity comes in. When you stop acting like a man, then your wife cannot compliment you. There are two women in the house. You think alike. So your thinking cannot, uh, and she must also think like a woman and act like a woman and reason like a woman. Then she compliments who you are. Now it's John, Genesis 3, 27. Uh, so be watchful. Stand fast in the faith. And kingdom says, quit you like men. Act like men. Number four, be strong. Be strong. In this context here, it means be strong in your convictions. That's why King James, I mean the Amplified Version, includes that. Um, stand firm in your faith and then be strong. Be strong. A another word for strong, another version, they use the word be courageous. That's what it means. Be brave. Be brave. That's what it means to be strong. Be brave. Be courageous. 
because you are the protector of the home, you've got to be courageous. To start a business, uh, uh, you take all your money and you put it in the business. You have retired. You decided to retire early. You're given a retirement package. And you realize that you cannot live on this package for the rest of your life. You, are, you want to grow it. You take all your pension funds. After having done um, some analysis uh, of the situation of the business environment, you have done that analysis. Then you take that money, you throw it into business. It takes courage, be courageous, be brave, uh, be strong. That is number four. Uh, is that not number four? It is number four. Number five. Let everything you do be done in love. That's number five. Let everything you do be done in love. That's our main act. Everything you do, you do it in love. True love to God and true love towards men. You don't do things motivated by resentment and bitterness. No. Even when a child is wayward, you don't hate your child. You will woo your child back to the right path by loving your child, loving your wife. Just be generally a loving person. To be loving is to be manly. To be loving is to be manly. It's amazing how the Bible gives an injunction to men, men, husbands love your wives. And you don't find many scriptures that says wives love your, your husbands. There, there, there is one or two, but most scriptures are encouraging men to love their wives and create a lovely environment where they live. These are the ways in which you must uh, act like men. Now to revise what you talked about before I give an opportunity to ask questions for us to interact on these matters because they are important. Let's just revise quickly what we have said and say how the Lord will help us. Act like man. Act like man. So let's see how God is going to be helping us on this matter of acting like men. We said in the beginning there are three kinds of men. Natural man, a spiritual man, and a man of God. And we explained that a natural man is not is a man who is not born again. So the first thing then that must happen to you if you act like man, you must be born again. It's not scandalous for a man to raise his hand and give his life to Christ. It's not a scandal. It is not. Actually, the scandal is that you're a man who is supposed to work with God and you are not working with God. You are not working with God, you're not walking with God. That's a scandal. It's a shameful thing for a man not to, to be Christian, quite frankly. So the number one is the natural man. If you're on this program and you, do, you have never received Christ as Lord and Savior, would want to talk to you and pray with you about it. Number two, there's a born again man. It's called a spiritual man. Where's the Spirit of God? Oh, I pray that you are that kind of a man, a man who is insightful because the Spirit of God gives him insights into the things of God and into life in general. 
Oh, I pray that you'll be an insightful man. And then number three, there is a, a man of God. All of us would strive to be men of God. Men who are righteous, men who are godly, men of faith, men of love, men of endurance, and men of gentleness. Oh, I pray that all of us will become men of God. That designation, man of God, is not reserved only for, for very few people. Those are behind the pulpit, those who preach, they are the only ones who can be called men of God. No, you can be a man of God too. So you must put away childish things and begin to embrace uh, manly things, things that men should do. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8, deal with that. Things to avoid and things to inculcate in your life. Avoid boasting, avoid envy, avoid pride, avoid self-seeking, avoid anger, Avoid uh, keeping records of the wrongs that other people do and avoid delighting in evil. But instead, you must um, embrace those things that uh, you ought to embrace in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. 13 and verse 11. And finally, we talked about the theme talk, act like man. How do you act like man? Uh, you must be watchful. Uh, you must stand firm. Uh, you must uh, act like man. You must be strong in your faith. You must do everything in love. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord really cause the teaching of his word to sink in you. May you make a resolution that in the light of these scriptures, which we have meticulously gone through, you will act like man. The heavens are demanding it. God is, God is tired of people who act like child. It's childish for you. We are a man. 50 years old, 60 years old. Your, your son is called a boyfriend. You too are called a boyfriend. That's childishness. That's childishness. Just do away with all childish things and childish, childish behaviors and act like me. We'll ask a... Uh, Mr. Maduna, you need to pray for us. And then let's let's close the recording now. And then Mr. Maduna will pray for us. <laughs> 